Um, our next speaker is Jonathan Dennis, and he is going to be talking about hierarchical regulation of genome response. <coughs> All right, Shelley and Bob and Jurg, it's a real honor to be able to present my lab's work to this group of scientists at this meeting. So thank you very much for that opportunity. As far as I can tell, it was about 50 years ago that the first observation was made that histones may possibly function as gene suppressors. That's to say that nucleosomes might differentially allow access to DNA to generate different cell types. Now it's 64 years later, and we have a whole load of genetic and uh, genomic and epigenomic experiments that tell us that cells of different physiologies do indeed differ in gene expression. DNA is one hypersensitivity, histone post-translational modifications, replication timing, DNA methylation. However, studies looking for differences between different cell types in terms of their nucleosome positions When, uh, so cell types A and B show relatively few differences in nucleosome distribution. And we can talk about the few differences that we do see in the question time. But when we in my lab, if I were to take a, uh, a white cell and a epithelial cell and ask the question, at how many of the human transcription start sites do we see different translational positions of nucleosomes, I would come up with a number of around 2%. And this has been very frustrating for about the past decade for me. So we took a little bit of a different approach. What we did was we stimulated cells with some, and I'll show you the different stimuli and the different situations that we use, but we stimulated cells and we looked on a time frame commensurate with that stimulation and did a high, high temporal resolution study of what's going on with the nucleosome distribution in these cells. And what we found was there are translational redistributions of nucleosomes, and they're widespread. The problem in our, our experiments was they were transient, and we had missed them. So in my lab, we study uh, uh, oncogenic transformation and cancer progression, viral reactivation, treatment with psychostimulant drugs of abuse, and the innate immune response. In every single one of these systems, we have observed widespread and transient nucleosome, uh, translational uh, nucleosome repositioning. For the purposes of today's talk, I'm going to focus on one story about uh, the reactivation of Kaposi sacoma virus. <clears throat> and what we've used is a, uh, um, a model system. We've reactivated KSHV in ISLK cells, and we've harvested cells at 6, 12, 24, and 48 hours after the reactivation of the virus, and we've done a very typical MNA-seq set of experiments. One difference for our experiments, however, is that we sequence only uh, the transcription start sites plus and minus 1,000 bases on either side, and what this allows us to do is multiplex 8 to 12 human libraries in one lane of a high-seq uh, experiment. So all the statements I'll make about, all the statements I'll make in this talk have to do with transcription start sites. Sometimes I say genome-wide. I don't mean to be misleading when I say that, um, but we're talking about all transcription start sites genome-wide. So this is uh, the distillation of a set of results from the, uh, from the MNA-seq of the KSHV uh, data. And over here we have uh, the number of transcription start sites with different translational 
uh, with nucleosome redistributions uh, at each of these time points. So we asked a question, out of the 21,000 human uh, transcription start sites, how many showed changes in nucleosome distribution? At the six-hour time point, not very many. At the 12-hour time point, not very many. At the 24-hour time point, 16 percent. And this went back down at 48 hours. And in microarray experiments, we know that at 72 hours, it goes just about back down to normal. That's to say that 3,400 genes total, one in six genes in the human genome, uh, had translationally repositioned nucleosomes. And I can show uh, flip book pictures like this, where uh, here's a transcription start site, here's our tag count. The black will always be zero in these pictures, and we can flip through it and look at six hours, no change, uh, 12 hours, a little bit more change, 24 hours, more change, and it goes back by 72 hours. And I could show you about 3,000 of these flip books, but that would be a tedious, terrible talk. Um, what, uh, what I do want you to notice, however, is it's the 24-hour time point where we see these clear, where I, for the first time, who's been doing this experiment for about a decade, for the first time I see these very clear uh, remodeled nucleosomes. So the next question uh, we wanted to ask is, well, do these nucleosomes move for a purpose? Might these nucleosome redistributions potentiate regulatory factor binding? So to answer this question, we uh, did a version of an analysis done by, in the Hennikoff lab and uh, Nick Kent, where we used the subnucleosomally sized fragments as surrogates for transcription factor binding. And we took these small fragments, and for every, in this case, in the epithelial cell line, because ISLK is an epithelial cell line, we took all of the known uh, chip data sets and looked at uh, subnucleosomal sized fragments at the regulatory factor binding site. And here, for example, is uh, our analysis of the CTCF binding site. On this axis, we see all uh, chip validated uh, CTCF binding sites. The solid line is our subnucleosomal fragments acting as a surrogate for small transcription factor or regulatory factor sized protections. This is zero hours, 24 hours, and 48 hours. And what we see is uh, some, some level of protection at the CTCF binding site, that being reduced at our 24-hour time point, and it returning back to normal at the 48-hour time point. We can show these in a heat map uh, to make the point that we can actually identify the CTCF binding sites where we have inferred increased or decreased protection or binding by making a subtraction of our subnucleosomal sized fragments at the 48-hour time point from the zero-hour time point. And we can see these have increased footprinting here and decreased footprinting here. So we thought about this for a while, and this has gone through several names, and I guess uh, what, what I've settled on for the time being is there's what I would like to call a, tra a genomic transient intermediate state. And this transient intermediate state is induced by a widespread remodeling event. And in this transient intermediate state, a superset of loci, in this experiment, one in, six loci, one in six transcription start sites in the human genome, are made available for some type of regulation. Gene sets in the loci with the appropriate regulatory machinery will be acted upon. There is, however, no cost or consequence of remodeling a gene that doesn't have transcription factors that could turn it on aberrantly. And so what I think this does is this maximizes the potential for multiple specific concerted responses with a limited number of genomic architectures. So this is uh, a model we've made. What I would uh, think, would be, think is going on is you have all transcription start sites. A lot of those have uh, altered uh, nucleosome distributions, and that, uh, that number of targets gets progressively refined with uh, opportunistic regulatory factor binding and ultimately the licensing of some sort. And about three months ago, that's where this talk would have ended. But I just want to add one more piece onto this model based on a validation experiment that we do for MNA seq experiments. And the validation experiment that we do for MNA seq experiments is based in this uh, observation first made by Trivenoff in 1980 that uh, 
as the, the deformation of DNA around the histone octamer is aided by A and T containing dinucleotides spaced every 10 bases to create a wedge, interdigitated with G and C containing dinucleotides every 10 bases. And when you plot all of your nucleosome size fragments in an MNA-seq experiment um, and center them, so these are all 147 to 151 length fragments, and plot on this axis AT containing dinucleotide frequency, you end up with this very nice pattern. And this is a very typical pattern uh, with your AT nucleotides evenly spaced at 10 base increments, reflecting the rotational phasing of the nucleosome around uh, the rotational phasing of the DNA around the histone octamer. So I asked Brittany Sexton, who did these experiments, would you please just take a look at the AT periodicity at all of the time points? And this is what we saw. We saw this very nice typical periodicity at 0, 6, 12, and 48 hours. But at 24 hours during this time that I call the genomic transient intermediate, we see this very aperiodic pattern. And uh, it takes about 5,000 uh, fragments to get this pattern, to get the average pattern to come out. So I asked Brittany, would you please take 5,000 random fragments out multiple times? Every time we do this, we get an aperiodic pattern. And that suggests to me that, oh, sorry, so what do I think is going on here? In order to lose that rotational phased type picture, you only have to move one or two bases and I think there is some tiny, tiny, tiny motion going on throughout the entire genome. So loss of this rotational phasing at apparently all nucleosome fragments indicates to me that remodeling may be, I want to say a TSS wide, I beg your pardon, uh, happening at every single transcription start site. Might be a truly global event. And what this says to me, I've always had trouble with this notion of targeting. This says to me remodelers might not be targeted to specific loci. Rather, remodeling is this genome-wide, TSS-wide event that's either a vibration, uh, that's a vibration with a subset of loci being translationally repositioned. And this has really made me think hard about how regulation may be happening in the nucleus. So now we have this new model in which uh, you hit the cells with a stimulus. We see indiscriminate global remodeling. It maybe it might not result in a full translational repositioning, but it does result in some level of a nucleosomal, what I'll call vibration. And this is refined to the ones that can be remodeled, actually moving at a superset of loci, which creates the opportunity for regulatory factors to bind. And uh, the number one implication of this work is for me, for the first time, I've been able to document nucleosomes moving like the Stedmans had predicted in the 50s. But also, it makes me think, like I said in the previous slide, about uh, is, is genomic regulation the result of the biochemical state of the genome and the protein catalog in the cells, and if you open it up at the right place in the right time, the right things happen. And we can talk more about this in the questions or later if you want. Um, I'm fortunate to have an incredible lab uh, who does this work for me. And three of these folks are here. I featured most of the work of Brittany today um, to make it as shorter, but uh, Ingshua has the, a very similar story in the Drosophila innate immune response, and Daniel goes into detail about another part of the story, including fragile nucleosomes and how we actually make that enriched library. Thank you. Yes. So very interesting. Um, I'm not familiar with the KSHV agent that you are using to yes. induce uh, this phenomenon. Yes. And uh, I wonder if you've tried other signaling Absolutely. Uh, pathways and activations and, Ab and seen whether you get a similar global response? Is the timing the same? Because some, some things like acute or immediate early response are so, 30 minutes. And absolutely. Like that. So having said that uh, not everyone's familiar with the Kaposi sarcoma virus reactivation in ISLK cells, are there other examples? As a matter of fact, in every single one of those examples, oncogenic transformation, 
uh, the innate immune response. We've shown in the innate immune response to uh, gram-positive cells, Ingsha's posters on gram-positive cells, uh, gra treating fly S2 cells with gram-positive bacteria to elicit the immune response, and the time frame is commensurate with the immune response. That is to say, her greatest remodeling happens 30 minutes after, and there is recovery by one hour and four hours after. The same is true for human macrophages and T-like cells, Jercot cells, uh, using both gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria, and LPS. Uh, viral reactivation. Oh, and with psychostimulant drugs of abuse, the picture is less clear with that. Um, I think it happens very quickly, and we can totally disrupt the genome with uh, cocaine, but I don't have as much. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is there a common GP130 signaling cascade among those, or is no. there a common you know, uh, elements of signaling? So I don't believe there's common elements of signaling among those. Can I tell you one commonality between them, however? Um, when these nucleosomes are translationally repositioned, and I left this part out of the talk, they, two-thirds of them in several of the cases, certainly two-thirds in the KSHV situation, are translationally repositioned to, to positions that we would predict from the underlying DNA sequence. Now, Brittany took, uh, we had published a paper on cancer in cell cycle a while back where we showed these nucleosome redistributions in lung adenocarcinoma. And Brittany took, compared the DNA-directed KSHV positions to the DNA-directed uh, cancer positions. And they're going to the, it's sort of self-fulfilling because you know they're both DNA-directed, but you have this class of redistributions that are going to the exact same position every time, no matter what the cellular context is. Um, and I believe she has those pictures on her poster comparing colorectal cancer, KSHV, and lung cancer. It's pretty amazing. And there's a paper on that called the spring-loaded genome. Uh, quick question. Yes. Have you actually looked at this in the consequence of um, um, inactivating any of the chromatin remodeling? No. <laughs> so the question is, have you ever looked at, have you knocked out any of the chromatin remodelers? And no, we've looked in cells, in cancer cells that are deficient in remodelers. Um, however, what I think has happened in those, and we see no differences, what I think has happened in those cells is there are redundant and compensatory mechanisms that make it so those are the ones that survive in cell culture. What I'm just starting to do right now is making uh, fluorescently tagged protein, uh, remodeling proteins or remodeling motor proteins so we can, I mean, the dream is that we could uh, hit a macrophage with uh, an immune stimulus and watch perhaps uh, remodelers moving in a targeted way or a chromatin-based way. So since the localization of the chromatin is quite important in the nucleus, do, don't you think that this could have an impact on the movements that you see of the nucleosome in different situations? So if the... So, so the, the, the chromatin localization in the nucleus is important to have heterochromatin, euchromatin, and some yes. dynamics. So how is this going to work with your model? So the, the question, I think, is uh, what is the relationship between these local changes yeah. in nucleosome redistribution and higher order chromatin structural That's features? It. Uh, at the very beginning of my research program, that was the exact question we were asking. And we were doing a, a sensitivity assay that looked a lot like a high c experiment. I'll just leave it at that. We could never find a relationship between uh, nucleosome redistributions and the measurements that you're talking about that are about three orders of magnitude higher uh, or lower resolution, yes? So when nucleosomes move, we did not see changes in the overall sensitivity or compartmentalization of the nucleus. So we did not see that relationship. And I wanted there to be a relationship, and we did not see it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we're going to move on to our last speaker.